Hi, this is David Orlovsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Orlovsky Show, which I think I can say with confidence is the last one of the year. And uh, before I get down to business, I got a lot to talk about. I got a lot to say. I got to get everything in before the end of the year. I'm given a certain allotment of words every year. As luck would have it, I have a whole bunch left over from last year. I'm going to try to use them up today. But first of all, we have a sponsor. And the person who's sponsoring is a close friend and uh, someone who participates in my shirim. And uh, I want to read you what he wrote, first and foremost. Sponsored anonymously is a schuss for the donors. So I'm not going to mention his name, because otherwise I think that would kind of defeat it. Right? You know the story about the Jew who stands up and says, I, Harry Rabinowitz, of Rabinowitz's Lady Wear, on uh, Orchard Street, do hereby pledge $1 million anonymously. Yeah. So uh, when a person says they want an anonymous, that's for sure. Now, I happen to know that this person has been involved with an organization called dailygiving.org. And he wants to sponsor it not just as a schus for him and his family, but also for the organization. And he writes, it would be a huge schus for me and a favor if the Rub could speak about dailygiving.org. So uh, I'm going to show you a video. And uh, let me tell you what's amazing about this video, especially to me. Um, everybody's in it. <laughs> it's Marja, who's who of all of the greats of Klai Yisrael, the Gedolim, uh, Rashi Shiva, Mashbiim, uh, speakers, authors, bloggers, podcasters. The only person who's missing is me. <laughs> I was the only one that asked to participate in this video. <laughs> but, noch besser, I get to dedicate a podcast uh, to this wonderful, wonderful cause. I want you to watch this. It is moving and informative. Uh, I want you to watch the video now. Okay, I have a life hack for you. You should just do this now. Trust me, you're going to thank me later. I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you something extraordinary. Literally everybody is talking about dailygiving.org. Even a dollar a day can make a huge impact. With dailygiving.org, you sign up once, you set it, and you forget it. Every single individual gives half a shekel, the rich and the poor, because everyone together is a part in making the change. And it always bothered me. How come we don't have half a shekel concept today? And then I was introduced to something amazing called dailygiving.org. A dollar doesn't really go very far in the current market. Lots of times you give a dollar to this, a dollar to that, and it doesn't really feel like it's making a big impact. But when you give it together as a community, it has a really meaningful impact. A hundred percent of every dollar you give every day goes to help these organizations. We're loading up another truck with groceries to the elderly. We're able to provide services for over 50 families with kids with special needs and intellectual disabilities this summer due to the generosity, support, partnership, and friendship of everybody at Daily Giving. This is equipment that is crucial for saving lives. We wouldn't have had all this without support from Daily Giving. You could see every day who's getting the money, how much they're getting, and you can go back to the very beginning when we started and see every day who got the money, and you see the dollars growing as more people sign up and more people sign up and we get more momentum. To give a dollar a day, it's not asking too much, and if you can do it, we'll be able to all the It's like Klal Yisrael's one big giant virtual tzedakah box, and they take care of your donation and they make sure it goes to extremely worthy causes. You have ranging from couples suffering with infertility to women with breast cancer to uh, people suffering from poverty that need help with food and living accommodations. They've helped people that I know very well to supply food for them and to help them make chasanas for their children. It's so important that we're givers. It's so important that we are always flexing the giving muscle. And no matter what's going on, every single day I know that I've given something. It's the one email I always read. It makes me feel like I actually gave that day. I'm not that old, but I remember the days that you can get a slice of pizza for a dollar. Today, what can you get for a dollar? But when you put all of our dollars together, 
all of a sudden the dollar becomes huge. The Gemara has an expression called Pruta Pruta Mitzdarefes Lechesh Ben Gadol. When it comes to tzedakah, every penny counts. One of my daughters actually today asked me, I have to give my tzedakah. Can I give to daily giving? It's not necessarily a year's worth, but can I give a few months worth? And you know, to me that was, it was, it made me happy. This is not instead of giving to other organizations. We want everybody to try to give one extra dollar a day together, and that's how we can have a massive, massive impact. So that is your life hack. Go now to dailygiving.org, sign up. You're gonna get those emails. They're gonna make your day. You put me into quarantine and I did better. I can't touch another person, yet I'm touching thousands at a time. Go check it online right now. Look at the calendar and you will see every dollar that's given goes directly to another organization. How do you get the biggest bang out of your buck, out of your dollar? It's called dailygiving.org. I think you got the idea. You sign up and you give a dollar a day. And uh, you see that it's being used in wonderful, wonderful ways. And uh, what can I tell you? Uh, I'm McCann of these people. I'm jealous. I wish I had that level of sincerity. I always think of the quote of Groucho Marx, the most important thing is sincerity. If you can fake that, the rest is easy. But there are some people who don't have to fake it, it's real. So this is an important schus going into Rosh Hashanah. Uchu va utfila utstaka ma'avir in And staka, you have the word written underneath it, mamon, which means money, mula, Cash, mucho dinero, yeah? So uh, uh, I'm not very subtle, but uh, it sounds like a great thing to do, and I myself plan on signing up. I haven't done it yet because I'm in the middle of making this podcast, and I think it would, uh, you know, you have to, like, minimize the window, and then I would never get it back. And I don't know if I mentioned, <coughs> Michal, my producer's not here. <coughs> I'm doing this myself. Anyway, so uh, so that's it. What a, what a great way to end the year with such a wonderful sponsorship from a wonderful person who should have a wonderful year and all of us should have a wonderful year along with it okay so i got a bunch of stories i have some stuff i gotta tell <laughs> i don't know if i ever told this one i don't know if i ever told this one yeah um i have uh i used to be the long island director of ncsy and uh i'm uh I'm a, I'm a big follower of rules. I think I think rules are important. Yeah. So we used to say, if you're going to come for the Shabbaton, you have to come for the whole Shabbaton. You have to come from Friday till Sunday morning. And sometimes people would say, yeah, but I got my brother's bar mitzvah over Shabbos. Could I come Moti Shabbos? And I'd say, gee, I'm really sorry. You have to come for the whole thing. They said, it's not my fault. I said, I understand. Sometimes people say, I have a very important test that I have to take Sunday morning. Could I come just for Shabbos? And I say, no, I'm afraid not. And people couldn't understand why, but I feel very much the concept of lo plug chachamim, that the sages did not make exceptions, because once you get into exceptions, it's a slippery slope. I'll give you an example. There was a division of NCSY called Junior NCSY, and there was a steer in Bay, because it said it was for grades 5 to 8, and ages 10 to 13. So, okay. So what do you do? So there was a nine-year-old who was in fifth grade. So a mother calls up and says, you're taking that boy, he's nine years old. I said, but he's in fifth grade. I said, yeah, but it says from 10 to 13, you're not telling that kid he can't come. So if you're taking nine-year-olds, you have to take my son, even though he's in fourth grade. And then a mother of an eight-year-old calls up and says, I didn't know you're taking fourth graders. My son is in the same grade with the fourth grader. So you have to take him. But Kane Hall, in the end, we had people with carriages wheeling in uh, toddlers. I mean, it was, it was, it was just, there was no way to control it. Because, uh, you know, not everybody is very good when it comes to exceptions. I'm terrible at it. How do you know who to make an exception for? Uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. So, uh, so I would just, that was my position. There were no exceptions. No exceptions. There were people who were upset at me. But what can I do? I, if I make an exception for you, then I have to make an exception. Now I have to decide, is his excuse good enough? Is her excuse good enough? What do we make an exception for? Not so, okay. Now I want to tell you that it was coming from a place of intellectual honesty and what I believe to be Yemis. Now I have to tell you a story. One of my regional presidents, uh, who today, 
uh, lives in uh, Minneapolis, Yonis and Kalman Spar. He was uh, a gift from a Kodesh Baruch Hu during my time at NCSY, as many of my regional presidents were, who I still am the schuss to maintain uh, relationships with today. But, uh, you know, it happened to be he was learning in Eretz Shell when we made uh, Aliyah. And we we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> the only way to make Aliyah is not to think about it. You know, the people make lists and, and plans and stuff like that. Just fill up as many suitcases as you can and get on a plane, hope for the best. You know, my brother, <laughs> my brother, Bruce, who is one of the Lama Dvav Tzadikim, of our generation, you know, he cleaned up the mess that I left before. He's done this many times in my life, you know, but he came into my house. He says, it looked like a crack house that just got a call. The police were on the way. There, there was there was still food in the refrigerator. Uh, nothing had been taken care of. I'm like, how do you just leave like that? Ah, that's how you make a you know? So I came to Eretz Shell and everything was, was a wreck. I mean, it was really not planned out well. I remember that, uh, you know, my five-year-old, we told her, you know, you have to go to sleep on the plane. And she started crying and she said, I can't sleep. I don't have a bed. I don't have a nightgown. I want to go home. And I look at my wife and she says, me too. <laughs> it wasn't planned well. What can I tell you? It wasn't, uh, you know. Um, but uh, that's how it was, you know. Uh, the chippah zone, we left Mitzrayim. You, know? <laughs> you, know, you have to just, just have to grab everything and go, yeah. So, uh so Yonis and Kalman was helping us uh, to settle in. Anyway, uh, I had gotten uh, uh, some things to my lift, and one of them was Pergament Uh I had bought this like office set that you could assemble. It came with a desk. It came with you know, a few little accoutrements to have like a little place to work, you know. And one of the things I needed was a night table. And he says to me, "Hey, look, the the desk set." comes with a two-drawer um, file cabinet, and you could use that as your night table. I said, I can't use it as a night table. It's a file cabinet. And he said to me, if you put the telephone on, this is back when there used to be regular telephones that were attached to the wall. If you put the telephone on top of it, open the drawer, you know, put in your Krishmalamita, put in your glasses, then it'll be a night table. And I looked at him and said, it can't be a night table. <laughs> it's a file cabinet. And he looks at me and he goes, now I get it. Now I understand. Of course, it can't be a night table. It's a file cabinet. That's why someone had to come on Friday and leave on Sunday. Not because of rules, just because that's the way your brain operates. Is that if it's a file cabinet, it, even if you call it, you could call it a night table. It doesn't become a night table because of file cabinet. Anyway, this story happened over 30 years ago. And to this day, when I will occasionally get stuck on certain ideas like this, my wife will just nod and say, I understand. It's a file cabinet. <laughs> so what can I tell you? you know, to my mind, there are certain things that just, you know, it has to be. So I told you I was going to finish uh, another uh, Seder of Pirkei Abbas. Now, you can argue that the sixth parak is not really Meseches Avos, and it's a group of races, and maybe you can leave out the sixth parak, but, but the fifth parak is definitely part of it. So I have to do the fifth parak. But it's just, it's almost Rosh Hashanah. You're not going to do a podcast about Rosh Hashanah? I can't. I said I was going to do Pirkei Avos. So I have to do the fifth parak of Pirkei Avos because it's a file gap. <laughs> But what am I supposed to do? It's, it's Rosh Hashanah. I put on my gold tie. You know, gold represents Midas Adin. Yeah. Silver represents Midas Arachimim. Gold represents Midas Adin. You know, Rosh Hashanah. I have to, I have to you know, get ready. But I have to talk about the fifth parak of Pirkei Avos because it, it, it's a file cabinet. <laughs> and so I have racked my brain over this. Now, full disclosure, I don't know what that means to rack your brain. I don't know. Did you put your brain on a rack? Did you? I, I don't know. I don't know what it means. It's an expression. Certain things I always wonder about. Yeah. Like, um, 
you could uh, make a non sequitur, but can you make a sequitur? Can you buy a single pant instead of a pair? <laughs> These are things that I'm curious about, but we'll, we'll put that aside. Yeah. As George Carlin says, flammable, inflammable, non inflammable. Seems like we could have done that in two words. Yeah. So I, I worked on this and I came up with a very simple solution. It tells the story of Rosh Hashanah in Perak Hamishi of Pirkei Abbas. Now watch, watch closely. I used to be a magician. Note that at no time do my fingers leave my hands. <laughs> There's a whole, a whole uh, sub set of jokes that are called magician jokes. Most of them are so corny that people would be embarrassed to, to say them over at any time. Certainly, if you were a professional magician, that's why so, so many magicians are so incredibly corny. It's just, it's just too painful to watch sometimes. But that's because they're, they're drawing on the standard magician uh, jokes. You know, some of them are pretty good. You know, so, but, uh, but that one I always like. No, it's at no time do my fingers leave my hands. Yeah, OK. So uh, I'll tell you another story now. Um, my parents took us away to a hotel. For Rosh Hashanah. My mother wanted to have the whole family together. And uh, we, uh, she couldn't accommodate us anymore. So she said, I'm going to take everybody away to a hotel. Okay. An, an interesting little side note. Um, uh, my father said to me at one point, you know, one of your brothers didn't come. I said, yeah, I noticed. He said, do you know why? I said, no. He says he didn't think it was appropriate to be in a hotel in Rosh Hashanah. You should be in your own home, not in your own shul. I said, I can hear that. He says, so why did you come? I said, I decided to be machmir and kibbutz of aim, which is one of the top 10 commandments of all time, even though it meant I might have to sacrifice some of my davening on Rosh Hashanah. He might have liked the answer. I don't know. My father was incapable of saying anything nice. <laughs> But he was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it was good enough. But anyway, so in between Milcham Ayyub, there was a Rav who was a partial scholar in residence. I don't know if he was the actual scholar in residence or they gave him a discount to come and uh, speak every now and then. But he got up to speak and he said, what number do you think would best represent Rosh Hashanah? And people immediately said, 10. There are 10 psukim of Malchios. There are 10 psukim of Zichronos. There are 10 psukim of uh, 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 Shofras. Um, the world was created with Asara Mamaros, with 10 expressions. Yeah? And he started saying, what are the 10s do you know? And uh, this, Sarah Sadibros, the Esumakos, you know. So me, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was young, I was young, much easier to intimidate than I am today. It's harder to intimidate me. I still can be intimidated, but a little harder, yeah. I said, the 10 tests of Avraham. And he stops. Like, it didn't matter what anybody else said. He looks at me and says, what does that do with anything? <laughs> so I'm going to give a different answer today. But at the time I said, well, it's a 10. He said, so what? <laughs> I said, well, the 10th test of Avraham was a Kedus Yitzchak, which we mention in Musaf, and we blow Shofar because of, uh, of uh, um, the ram that Avraham uh, sacrificed in place of his son to remember a Kedus Yitzchak. So I guess the 10 tests do have something to do with Rosh Hashanah. And he says, all right, and he went on, but obviously he hadn't prepared that. This is a, a very sad thing. You know, I had a young lady who was learning in a seminary. She comes over to me and opens up a POSIC, and she says, why does it say that? Okay, so I opened up the Mikros Gedolos. Nobody asks it. So I look around. It turns out it's a Gemara and Zvachim. They learn out of din from those words. She said, I knew it. So the Chumash teacher says, Okay, take apart this pusik and ask all the questions. That was my question. 
And she looked down and she said, nah, uh, Torah always talks that way. <laughs> and she says, and I was so, f- why wasn't my answer a good answer? Yeah. I said, the answer is because she prepared for the Mikros Gadolas and nobody mentioned your question. So your question is not a question. Yeah. If I didn't see an answer to it, then it's, then it's not a legitimate question, which of course is backwards. And, uh, I'll never forget the moment uh, I was in Shia and he set up a whole list of my Macomos and he asked all his cashes and he goes, no, the guy gave a tarot. And he just stopped and said, that's right. That's right. It's so simple. Say it again. I says it again. He goes, it's so obvious. I, I don't know why I didn't say it. Say it again. Yeah. And he just, he just didn't give that cheer. He talked about something else instead. Found a different thing to talk about. But you don't just say because I didn't think of this answer or I didn't see this answer. The question's not a good question. Yeah? So I was I was very disappointed in this rabbi for this level of lack of intellectual honesty because he hadn't prepared this. But as it happens, what's the fifth parak of Perkiyavos? How does it open? The world was created with ten expressions. Couldn't he have created the whole world in one moment? And rather to collect from the Rishayim who destroy the world and to reward the Tzadikim. Ten generations from Adam to Noach to show you how much patience Hashem had waited 10 generations before he brought the flood. Yeah, 10 generations from Noah to Avraham to show you how much patience Hashem has until Avraham Vino came along and took the schus of all those generations. 10 tests, Hashem tests Avraham. Oh my goodness. Goodness gracious, that sounds almost like what I said as a young man. 10 tests of Avraham. Vama Vekulam. Ten miracles were done for the Jews in Egypt and ten at the sea. And ten plagues he brought to the Egyptians in Egypt and at the sea. Ten times we tested God. There were ten miracles that were done for our forefathers in the Beis HaMikdash, and the Mishnah goes on to list them. Ten things were created in the twilight of creation. Now, why would the Mishnah put all these 10 things together unless all 10 of them have a connection? This is the concept of the Esher Spheris. Spheris is a very difficult concept, but it means that there are 10 aspects to creation. They parallel parts of the human body. The lower seven are the ones that we usually reference, Chesed, Vura, Tiferes, Netzach, Hod, Yusod, and Malchus. The seven weeks in between Pesach and Shavuos, we work on one of those Midos every day. During Sukkot, we had to combine it because there were no holidays in Tammuz, Av, and Elul. They all had to be condensed into Tishrei. So we only had seven days to do seven levels, that's the Ushpizen, the seven guests that we welcome in to the sukkah. Each one represents a different midah. Avraham is chesed, Yitzchak is gvura, Yaakov is teferis. You get the idea. They parallel those lower seven. The days of the week parallel those days. Right? The first day is chesed. The second one is uh, gvura. The third one is Teferis. Shabbos is obviously Malchus. That's why we say Shabbos Malkusa. Shabbos Queen. They represent the seven Kochve Leches, the seven heavenly bodies you can see with the naked eye. 
Sunday is Sunday for the sun. Moon day. Monday is moon day for the moon. Saturn day is for Saturn, which represents Shabbos. That's why the rings around it are a crown. They represent parts of the body, etc. So all of these, th these seven, those are the ones we usually access. Those are the seven days of the week. On rare occasions, we add in the other three. So, for example, Avram Avinu was promised 10 countries. We got seven of them, and three we will get La'asad Lavai, the Torah tells us in Devarim. We were supposed to get all 10. But because of the Miraglim, we messed up, and we only got seven. Three we'll get later. And this uh, idea of the seven and the other three pops up in a lot of places. The only place where we have a 10-day unit of time is called the Aserah Simei Tshuva, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. And as you can imagine, those 10 days parallel all of these 10s that we're talking about. Sometimes they're going forward, and sometimes they're going backwards. The Maharal says the Aserah Dibros correspond to the Asara Mamoros with which the world was created. Whenever you see these tens, they're all talking about the same thing. You have ten fingers on your hands because the Kodesh Baruch Hu created the world in base ten. It's not that we work in base ten because we have ten fingers. You have ten fingers because Hashem created the world in base ten. Tom Lehrer, who is a professor of mathematics in Harvard University, but is better known for writing funny songs, wrote a song about new math, the new math. This was in the early 60s. And uh, after he does the whole equation, he says, but the book I got this out of wants you to do it in base eight. But don't worry, base eight is just like base 10 if you're missing two fingers. <laughs> but the idea of the 10 spheres being part of, of the creation of the world, that's what went into the creation. Asar Mamaros, when Hashem said each one of these expressions, he was creating an aspect of creation, what we call the ten spheres. And that's the process that we're working on. Now, the top three are called the Mochen. They are the head. Yeah, you know, men and women, one of them is stronger with the right side of the brain and one of them is stronger with the left side of the brain. And so the top, the levels two and three are called Chachma and Bina, two different ways of thinking. One represents men, one represents women. And the top one is Keser. Very hard to reach Keser. It's a, a crown on top of the king. When we start with Malchus, which is the lowest level, which is kingship, the goal becomes to put the crown on the head of the king. That's like above it. The letters of the Aserah Dibros equal 620, which is Gematria Keser, to reach that level of the crown. On Rosh Hashanah, the theme is Malchus, because we're starting this process. Melech al Koretz, Mekadesh Yisrael. Melech al Koretz, Mekadesh Yisrael. Melech al Koretz. I, I grew up with a cousin. Anyway, and a choir. Um, and a show where over 60% of the people assimilated. <laughs> Is there a direct relationship? I don't know. Yeah. But um, uh, the uh, Malchus. <laughs> it's all about making Hashem the king. Recognizing Midas HaMalchus. Midas HaMalchus means you are the king and I am your servant. Kiyanu amechaviyata elokeinu. We are your people. You are our God. We are your servants. You are our king. We rep recognize Hakadosh Baruch Hu. He is in charge of everything, and and that is the avoda 
on Rosh Hashanah is to make Hashem Melech. That's step one. Then you move up the levels until on Yom Kippur you reach the level of Keser. That's where you can be forgiven for everything. You know the first Rashi in the Torah. Gracious Barai Elokim Eser Shemayim Eretz. Says Rashi, Elokim is Midas Ha Din. Because Hashem wanted to create the world in Din, and he saw that the world could not exist, and so he added in Rachamim. So, what does that mean? He wanted to create the world in Din, in judgment. And the answer is, you can't create a world in Din. Din means you deserve everything you get. How can you deserve to be created when you don't exist yet? There are people who argue that life begins at conception. And they want to define an, uh, life as beginning from that moment. And therefore, they want to defend the rights of the unborn because they say they're already people. But nobody has attempted to bring uh, a lawsuit against parents who've decided not to have children on behalf of the unconceived. This kid never had a chance to live because you decided not to have any children. That's, that's a stretch by anyone's imagination. How could somebody deserve to live who hasn't been created yet? How can a world deserve to exist if it doesn't exist yet? You can't create the world in din. Olam chesed yibane. You can only make the world as an act of chesed. Chesed is totally free will giving. dailygiving.org, just thought I'd throw that back in. You, you, it's an act of chesed. Once Hashem created the world as an act of chesed, he decided what would be the best way to set it up. And he decided the best way to set it up is din barachamim, so that you could earn and deserve all the reward that you get. People ask the question, you know, why does Rosh Hashanah come before Yom Kippur? Why are we being judged before we have a chance to have all of our sins forgiven? Wouldn't it be better to have Yom Kippur first, forgive all your sins, and then judge us? The answer is that just because you haven't done everything doesn't mean that you haven't done anything. Some things you did get right. A kid takes a test. He got a 40. He didn't pass, but he got 40% right. He knows 40% of the material. That's something to build on. I don't know if I ever mentioned this. When I used to teach in Derek, so Lazarus had what he called the no-fail test. The test wasn't filled with trick questions. The test was the Shackley Vitaya of the Gemara. What's the Gemara's question? What's the Gemara's answer? What's his proof? What's it? Just to make sure that you know the steps of the Gemara. And the rule was you needed an 80 to pass. So this one guy took the test, he got an 80, he's done. Another guy got a 40. He says, okay, it's pretty good. You have 40% down. You have to double that to pass. Study again, take the test again. The same test, because it's not, it's not a trick. It's not memorizing uh, A, B, C, D. It's uh, to make sure that you that you know the steps of the Gemara. So he goes back, he studies, he takes the test again, he gets a 60. He says, very good improvement, but you got to get an 80. So he goes back, he studies again, he gets an 80. He says, good. Yeah, you passed. He says, can I take the test again? He says, sure. He takes the test again, he gets a 90. He says, all right, that's it. None of the other marks count. So the kid who got the 80 said, hey, I got an 80 at the first go, and this guy had four chances, and he's getting a higher mark than me? And Rabbi Lazarus said, because at the end of the day, he knows 90% of the Gemara, and you only know 80%. Do you want to study and take the test again? He said, no. Then you'll only know 80%. But the message was, you know 40%. That's pretty good. That's a good start. When you walk into Rosh Hashanah, although it's true I haven't done everything, it's not true that I haven't done anything. And first I want a din. What did I do right? Don't tell me everything I did wrong. First, let's talk about what I did right. What did I get right? Let's see where we can uh, build from here. 
my brother brought a very old house and uh, he had to uh, rebuild it. So the first thing he did is bring in the builder to say, what's still good? What can we salvage? And then work from there. Now, even though not everything in the house is good, I don't have to raise it completely because not everything is bad. Some of it's good. We're so good at beating up on ourselves and forgetting that we do do some good things. So first we want to be Zaychibedin. What do I deserve? The Melech is a judge. He judges you. And after that, we slowly move our way up until on Yom Kippur we come to Keser. What's Keser? That goes on top of the head. Before HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to create the world in Din, he decided to create the world. That was Keser. That's the crown. That's the Chesed Olam Yibaneh. That was the original Machshava is he wants a world. And so he builds the world up to that point where we can go to that original machshava that we want a world. And if you destroy us, then Hashem, you won't get what you want. Forget about what we want. We won't get what you want because you want a world. And if you destroy us, there won't be a world. So we have to go out of Din, the Rachmim, and go to the top. Go to Kesser. Go outside of the functioning of the world. And so we say, Ten Psukim of Malchias, and Ten Psukim of Zechronos, and Ten Psukim of Shoifris. Because the Shoifa is the tenth test of Avraham. What's the first one? Leich Lecha, Mi'atzchem, Right? Leave your home. Leave your family. Go where I'm going to show you. That's Malchus. That's the first step. Recognize that Kosh Baruch Hu is king, give up what you got, and do what the king says, even if I don't like it. Kosh Baruch Hu tells us to do things. Sometimes we don't want to do it. I told this story. I was going through a difficult time once, and a friend of mine, a Hasidisha, he says to me, Reb Levi Yitzhak Badichev was walking with his Hasidim, and he stopped, and he said, if I was a Kosh Baruch Hu, you know what I would do? They said, what? Just what he's doing now. Well, you think I'm smarter than him? And I laughed because, yeah, yeah, we think we're smarter than him. We think you're all powerful. You created the world from nothing. But now you dropped the ball, big guy. This you got wrong. I would have done this right. It really made me think. How many times do we think, Hashem, you got it wrong? When you say that, what you're basically saying is, I want to be God because I could run the world better. And I've got some ideas, death penalty for double parking, but that's not the point. I don't think I'd make such a good God. So someone said to me once, you know, what would you do if you were God? I said, I don't like the hours. You never get to sleep. You're on 24 seven. That's not for me. Leave that to the infinite beings. I'll work with my little corner of the universe. Little small things like I don't like giving a dollar a day to dailygiving.org, for example. <laughs> but but there are some things we can do. And then we move up and up and up and we climb up. And as we do, we're getting closer to a closer to a Kaddish Baruch. That's what it means when it says the dear Hashem Matsu, look for Hashem when he's with you. He's coming closer and closer to you until Yom Kippur. He's right there with you. These are the tens. And blow shofar to declare Hashem is Melech. Read the story at the beginning of Malachim. When it discusses when Adon Yahu was trying to make himself king and Shlomo Melech. You know, blowing shofar is part of making somebody the king. And so we say, Hashem, you're the king. We recognize you. And now we're going to begin that journey of getting closer and closer to you until we can move outside of the limitations of this world and reach Kesser. That original desire to create a world for us to live in, for us to be part of it.
you know, I get emails sometimes from uh, non-Jews who watch this podcast. Now, I have to be perfectly frank. I don't edit anything. I don't, I don't try to accommodate anybody. I think that's clear. My mother brought me up and said, if you have nothing nice to say, go right ahead. <laughs> I don't go out of my way. Go out of my way. You know? But I want you to know that when we're talking about Rosh Hashanah, it says clearly in the davening, it's not just the Jewish people, it's all of the Umas HaOlam. Zochreinu l'chayim, melech hafeitz b'chayim, v'kasveinu v'seiv ha'chayim. Right? Zochreinu l'chayim. Everybody. Who's going to live? That's a very important question. Okay. So two years ago, I came home from Yom Kippur and I said to my wife, you know, I had a really good davening with Shani Yom Kippur. I'm looking forward to a good year. And COVID hit and the economy collapsed. And right. So I came in the next year and I davened uh, with that in mind. And I came home to my wife and I said, I think things are going to be much better. And uh, I felt like the fellow who meets the little old man and he's very depressed and the little old man says, cheer up, things could get worse. He cheered up and sure enough, things got worse. So uh, so I don't know what's going to be this year. I have to tell you that my optimism has been dulled. I don't know. We're in the end of time. Things are coming, things are coming down, the, uh, down the tube pretty fast now. So I can't. I, I, I met a gal who sang the blues, and I asked her for some happy news. She just smiled and walked away because she was dead. It's supposed to be Janis Joplin or so. That's a pretty depressing idea. <laughs> People start to learn shot in that song, you know. What I'm saying, you know? <laughs> Asked for some happy news, just smiled and walked away. How many have we lost over the past two years? Why, why, why? I'm not making any comments. I'm not saying anything. You know, take the vaccine, don't take the vaccine. I have no idea. If you do turn into zombies and I have to cut off your head, don't take it personally. I have to do what I have to do to save mankind, and I'm sorry about that, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> but anyway, that's not important. I got COVID, so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fine. Anyway, but um, uh, yeah, I, I can't tell you what's going on. I, I, don't, know, I don't know who thinks, thinks they know an old expression, those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know. So I have no idea. All I know is that a Seris Mechuba from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is a very special opportunity for us to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to reevaluate our lives and to reach that original Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that will to create a world, Olam Chesed Yibane. Moshe Shapiro pointed out once, Midas Adin demands Midas Arachimim. The judgment demands mercy. Why? Because the world can't live in Din. And since Midas Adin also wants to do the will of Hashem, and Hashem wants a will, so he says, listen, I'll do the judgment, but you got to give me somebody, you know, to bring in some mercy, because otherwise there's not going to be a world, and you want a world. He wants us here. How many times did I meet people who said to me, I feel like Hashem doesn't care if I live or die. I said, make no mistake about it. There's no shortage of ways of getting rid of you. So if you're still here, it's because he wants you here. We're going to go in on Rosh Hashanah and we're going to say that Kodesh Baruch Hu. I haven't done everything, but I've done something. I'm a work in progress. I'm going to be better next year than I am this year. I'm a good investment. It might take me decades to become perfect. It took me over 20 years. So I became perfect. I got stuck on humility, but once I got that down, the rest was easy. 
In fact, I would say that humility is probably one of my greatest attributes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It is, but I can't say it. But anyway, it's not important. The important thing to remember is that Kaddish Baruch Hu can use a file cabinet as a night table. <laughs> he doesn't get stuck. Just the opposite. The Mesh Shapiro pointed out once. It's a trick. We make him the Melech, and the Melech has extra legal powers. He can pardon. Donald Trump said at uh, the uh, Al Smith dinner, he says, I was walking in, I bumped into Hillary. She said, pardon me. And he says, I have to get elected first. <laughs> yeah, she smiled. That was nice. But anyway, uh, the point is that Kaddish Baruch was the king. He can pardon. He can do anything he wants. What we have to do is recognize that he is Melech. Hi. Anyway, those are some of the ideas I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope everyone has a k'sirch simetayu for you and for all of Klai Yisrael. If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, rabbiolowski.com. If you want to find out about Daily Giving, you can go to their website, dailygiving.org. If you want to uh, uh, leave a comment, send me an email. I'm doing tshuva, so I, I took a couple of days and I knocked off a whole bunch of emails. I only got through about a month, but you know, I, I started catching up with some of my emails. Those of you who got a response, you know, I'm still there. <laughs> One time I did the opposite. I, I started at the end. I went all the way to the end of my emails. I started answering it. A guy wrote me. He says, "I wrote you this six years ago." <laughs> I know I get a little uh, a little backed up. <laughs> In any event, um, if you want to sponsor an episode, you can go over there. Whatever it is, you know, I've said this many times that I consider all of you, you know, we're all part of, of, of a Chabura. We're all B'nai Chabura. We all daven for each other. We all want to see the best for each other. We, I want to see everybody be able to have a wonderful year of bracha, and Hatzlocha, and Parnosa, Toiva, and Akiya, and Yerushamayim, and Achelik, and Toira, and Nachas from your Kindlech, and Nachas from your parents. Yeah, and you should all be Zoycha to have a special relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. And in Yitzhak Hashem, together we will go into the next year with a, a good din, Aksiva Chasima Toiva, for us and for all of Klai Yisrael. I'm David Orlovsky. And this is the last Gabrielowski show of the year. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky show. Torah and Simcha ready to go. The Rabbi Orlovsky show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode. And we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky show. On RabbiOrlovsky.com Torah Anytime YouTube and more It's Rabbi Orlovsky Show Torah and Simba Ready to go It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Till next time Till we meet again It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show Show